there. Uh, oh, yeah, the left um, kind of principle ideals of the semi group uh, ordered under inclusion. Okay, so the first example is kind of like the simplest LRB you can find. It's called uh, the free LRB. And as a set, this just consists of all words of length n, uh, or all words on the alphabet one through n, uh, where every letter is distinct. So for um, the free left regular band on three letters is gonna have 16 elements. It will have one empty word, uh, three words of length one, six words of length two, and six words of length three. And the way that multiplication works here is that you concatenate two words, um, but to make sure that you stay within the LRB, uh, you go through and you read from left to right and delete any letter that you've already seen. So this makes it satisfy that uh, XY equals, XYX equals XY equals XY. So for example, if we're in the free left regular band on three letters uh, and we wanna multiply two by three, two, one, uh, we concatenate them and get two, three, two, one, but delete the second two because we've already seen a two and just get two, three, one. Or if we wanna multiply one, two by three, one, two, we concatenate them and then delete the last one and two because we've already seen a one and two. And uh, like I mentioned, like these post sets associated to the LRVs are gonna play like a big role in kind of governing some of their structure. So, uh, and they kind of, for a lot of LRBs, turn out to be these like well-studied posets anyways. So um, it turns out it's maybe not like immediately clear, but it's not very hard to show that um, like the way to ideals are nested is if uh, the generator of one contain as a set, like the letters contain the set of the uh, letters of the second generator. And so this means that uh, the support semi lattice of the free LRB is going to be just the upside down Boolean lattice. So the set of subsets of one through n um, ordered under reverse inclusion. And the main example for today is going to be the uh, face monoid of the braid arrangement. So before we define that, we're going to talk a little bit about what the braid arrangement is. So um, the braid arrangement, there's this kind of like confusion with indices where uh, you usually index the braid arrangement by n minus one, and you think about living in Rn, and you have uh, n choose two hyperplanes. So one hyperplane for every pair of coordinates, and the hyperplanes are of the form xi equals xj for every pair. Uh, but we often think about it like one dimension down. So uh, when n is two, like the definition would give us uh, one hyperplane, this this one line in two space, uh, but we would kind of like project along like maybe this line perpendicular to x1 equals x2 and see this like as a one dimensional arrangement. And a2 would give us three hyperplanes, x1 equals x2, x1 equals x3, and x2 equals x3. Uh, but again, we project down um, just to two dimensions and, and get an arrangement that looks like this. So uh, every hyperplane arrangement um, can kind of be subdivided into these faces. So these like smaller pieces of, of the arrangement. So for like the braid arrangement, you're gonna have like one vertex so where all these hyperplanes intersect, uh, six one dimensional faces, these like rays, and then um, like six two-dimensional faces, these kind of regions between the hyperplanes. And in general, they are gonna go with uh, weak orderings on your xi coordinates. So the two-dimensional um, spaces will be places where um, like all your coordinates are distinct and maybe a ray is where two are equal, but um, it's distinct from the third. And like combinatorially, we can think about this in terms of ordered set partitions. So there's a map like taking these Weak orderings into ordered set partitions um, by putting, like, when two or coordinates are equal, putting them within the same block, and then ordering the blocks by 
uh, which coordinates are the largest. So this like this ray, you know, gets met here because x2 is the biggest and x1 equals x3. And a lot of kind of other like reflection arrangements have uh, some combinatorial interpretations as well. Okay, um, but these spaces can be defined for any hyperplane arrangement and turns out there's a way to multiply the faces. And you can think about this geometrically um, by thinking about starting, if you wanna multiply F by G, think about starting at some like arbitrary point in F and then take like an epsilon step towards G and see which face you land in. So if F is this uh, pink ray here and G is this green vertex, if we take like a very small step, we'll end up in this chamber uh, FG here. Uh, whereas if like we're multiplying G by H, if you take like an epsilon step in the shortest path towards H, you stay along this line and end up like in this purple spot here. And uh, the two dimensional regions are interesting in that uh, if you start there and take an epsilon step in any direction, you still stay in that region. So I would be equal to I times H. Um, and so this is kind of nice because it, you know, maybe it makes it easy to see how to multiply like in any arrangement, but not so good for computation. Or if you have like big hyperplane arrangements, you want some kind of easier way to compute them. Because once you get past two dimensions, it's kind of tricky to visualize this. Uh, so in the braid arrangement, there's a nice um, definition in terms of like the combinatorial interpretation uh, that I think is a little easier to use. So multiplying two faces in the braid arrangement is um, like multiplying two ordered set partitions. And the way uh, this works is that uh, to get the blocks of your new ordered set partition, you intersect the blocks of your two set partitions. So you start with like the first block of your first set partition and intersect it with everyone in order of your second, we go into the second block and so on. So if we wanted to multiply uh, this ordered set partition by this one, we first intersect one, two, six with three, five, six, and we just get six. Uh, then one, two, six with one, two, four, we get one, two, three, five with three, five, six, we get three, five, three, five is one, two, four is empty, which is the same with four and three, five, six, and then four and one, two, four gives us four. Um, and then at the end, we get rid of all the empty intersections and are left with a new ordered set partition. Okay, and so what does the uh, like associated coset to this uh, monoid look like? Uh, so um, here it turns out that like one uh, ideal is contained in the other, if and only if uh, the like unordered set partition of the first refines the unordered set partition of the second. And, and by refines, I mean, if you like take unions, you can take unions of the blocks of the first set partition to get the second. So um, that means that uh, the support semi lattice of this uh, braid arrangement face semi group is uh, the lattice of, of unordered set partitions. And this is also like a well studied um, post set. Okay. And then I wanted to say a little bit about why uh, one might want to study LRBs. So I think it seems like when people study LRBs, a lot of times they're actually studying the semi group ring or algebra associated to it. So if you take some uh, commutative ring K um, with a unit, uh, you can think about the semi group ring as being the free K module with basis B, and multiplication works in the way that you'd expect. And I think this is maybe not where they first appeared, but I think maybe what started to make LRVs popular is that they came up in, uh, they turned out to be pretty useful in like probability and uh, they were helpful in studying Markov chains and card shuffling in particular. So uh, people kind of noticed that several Markov chains or card shuffling operators could be modeled within left regular bands. 
So I don't know if, oh good, the laser does work. So um, I kind of put in one example from the free left regular grant, and it's like a shuffling operator, um, but a kind of inefficient way to shuffle cards called Renhu Top. So you can imagine that you have uh, a deck of N cards, and you pick one card at random and move it to the top. And that's like one shuffle. And so like you'll have to kind of do that a lot of times to make sure your deck is well shuffled, but it is um, one option. And uh, this can be seen within the free LRB semi-group ring by averaging the length one words. And then you can view your card decks as words of length n. And you can see here that if you do out this LRB multiplication, you get one third, one, two, three, which is like saying that you have a one third chance that you'll end up in this state, one, two, three, which happens if you just move the top card to the top. Or you can change it and put a two on top with one third probability or a three on top as well. And so this is like not uh, the most exciting shuffling operator, but it's kind of easy to see within the LRBs. And there are some kind of more popular ones as well, like the more typical way to shuffle your cards. Uh, ripple shuffling can also be seen uh, in the hyperplane arrangement, in this case, of the brain of the brain arrangement. And so not only can you see these Markov chains in, in the semi-group rings, but it's like a useful way to view them because um, you can use uh, LRB representation theory to get formulas for the eigenvalues of these Markov chains and shuffling operators uh, in terms of the combinatorics of that support semi-lattice. So people like to study the eigenvalues because it tells you uh, it helps you bound like the long term behavior uh, and you know how many times you need to shuffle a deck to make it well shuffled and um, the kind of formulas you get from LRB theory end up kind of being very efficient and made a lot of proofs easier for um, for some Markov chains out there and so a lot of people worked on this and so I didn't list them. <laughs> them all out, but I think kind of maybe the, the three first ones were, were uh, Bidegar, Hamlin, and Rockmore, who did this in the context of just the hyperplane semi-groups, um, and Brown and Diaconis also did it within hyperplane semi-groups, but kind of improved upon the results of Bidegar, Hamlin, and Rockmore. Uh, but then very soon after, Brown realized like there wasn't really anything just special to the hyperplane semi-groups. You could actually do this uh, process for any left regular band. And I think this is one of the first things that kind of took off the study of the LRBs. Um, and I also think that these are interesting rings to study beyond just Markov chains. Um, like for instance, they're kind of very, uh, like a lot of the algebra is explained by like the poset, which in my mind makes them kind of very combinatorial. So this like poset, the Supports on my lattice, like will index the simples, and it really kind of restricts how multiplication works and things like that. Um, and then there's also like more relations to poset in that there's a another poset associated to every left regular band, and um, this turns out to like reveal a lot of cool properties about um, the algebra. So uh, Margolis, Saliola, and Steinberg um, used like the topology of this poset to compute x spaces between the simple modules of these um, semi-group rings and also find projective resolutions of the simples. And, and lastly, I, I think one of the reasons I became interested in them is that um, they kind of group in a lot of semi-groups and combinatorial objects that I like to study, and it provides like a lens to study them all at once. So I, I started out kind of in the hyperplane arrangement world, um, but then learned about LRBs and turns out there's a lot of other combinatorial objects that have LRB structures like um, matroids and even cat zero cube complexes. So I, I like this as kind of one way to prove things for like all these different uh, objects. Okay, um, any questions so far? How the zero cube complexes, how they have the structure? 
Yeah, yeah, that was actually something Steinberg and, and Margulis and Saliola proved. But the faces of a cat zero cube complex, there's a way to define um, multiplication on them, kind of having to do with like the height, there's these hyperplanes and they give you kind of half spaces mm -hmm. and you compare like on which side of the hyperplane you are on. Um, there's a geometric, is the geometric. It's essentially um, like these really tracks and so You can you basically do it the same way she does here. You can have the hyperplane separating and give it any vertex, and then cube gives a unique gate that closes this vertex in that cube in the path metric, and the one goes into that vertex, and that gives you a reflection of vertices to faces and it sends faces to faces. And so the way, way you probably do faces is you just retract the face off of that face. You can do this for any test zero the uh, it's an Ira Morris Duper, whichever one or whatever it might be that I can say. <laughs> yeah. So it, you basically mimic what you do the hyperplane hyperplane to the zero cube complex. So you can do the entire kind of the retract of that basis. Which I think that's what this is. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to. Talk about like um, groups acting on these on these semi groups. So if a group acts on on your LRB by semi group homomorphisms, then it's going to act on the algebra by algebra homomorphisms, and also on this associated poset by poset automorphisms. Um, so that's kind of nice that all this like group theory goes through. Um, but also, I think kind of um, a lot of the LRBs like, or at least the ones that I learned about first, have a lot of, kind of have some natural group actions associated to them. So like every reflection arrangement has a reflection group acting on it and that will act on uh, the associated LRB. And so um, a lot of them kind of come with these natural group actions. So like the free LRB and the face modern of the bright arrangement are both acted on by the symmetric group in the way you'd expect. And uh, this can, in this context, you can kind of start to think about some questions from invariant theory. So classically in invariant theory, you're working with uh, polynomial rings and having a reflection group acting on your polynomial rings. Uh, but you can kind of think about these questions like for any ring, like in a group acting on, on an algebra by algebra homomorphisms. And like the two objects I'm going to be interested in mainly are invariant subalgebras and isotopic subspaces. So uh, for reasons that will maybe become clear later on, I like to think of these algebras as like rectangles and uh, the invariant subalgebra as like this kind of chunk at the bottom, which is just all the elements of your algebra that are fixed by everyone in the group. And if you're working with a, a good enough field, and I'm going to just work over C with everything, um, then the group is going to act semi-simply on your, on your algebra, and you can decompose it like, completely into irreducibles. And if you group irreducibles of the same isomorphism type, uh, we call those isotopic subspaces. So the invariance of algebra is just like one example of an isotopic subspace, it's the isotopic subspace when uh, you're looking at the trivial representation. Uh, but in general, you'll have one for every irreducible character. And these are also like some objects you can study. So kind of the like two main questions in invariant theory, uh, really the first is like the, the normal question you see, which is what does the invariance of algebra look like? Like what's its structure? Uh, but you could, keep going, if you have like an interesting invariant subalgebra, it turns out that all of these isotopic subspaces are modules over your invariant subalgebra. So you might be interested in, in what they look like as, as uh, invariant subalgebra modules. Uh, and in a way it kind of like helps you think about what the ring looks like both as a, a module over the group and the invariant subalgebra at the same time. 
And this is done a little bit in the like reflection group uh, classical case, and they call it like relative invariance there. But I've learned that I don't think this name is so popular. So that's what I will often call them though. Okay, so that's kind of like the questions that I'm interested in, but I'm interested in, you know, maybe the less traditional case where you set um, your algebra is not a polynomial algebra, you're working with an LRB, some, uh, an LRB algebra, and you have some group acting by semi-group homomorphisms on your LRB. So I'm curious, like, what the structure of the invariance of algebra looks like, and then what do these isotopic subspaces look like as modules over the invariance of algebra? Um, and so I'm not going to get into it today, unfortunately, for time, and because it also, I think it doesn't lend us nicely to the general story, but this is something that I worked on with um, my advisor, Vic Reiner, and my academic sister, Sarah Bronner, and we did this for kind of that very nice LRB I showed you at the beginning, this free LRB, um, which is acted on by the symmetric group, and we actually did kind of a Q analog of this as well, and it kind of turned out to have a nice answer. The variance of algebra was interesting. Uh, it was actually semi-simple, which doesn't usually happen, um, and kind of a lot of nice combinatorics came up. Um, but today, I'm mostly going to be talking about um, the base monoid of the braid arrangement acted on by the symmetric group. And I'll probably be calling this the base algebra a lot. OK, so let's talk about what these answers look like for the base monoid of the braid arrangement. OK, so the story. Um, brings another algebra into play that's called Solomon's Descent Algebra. So um, if you have some permutation, uh, you can associate a subset of one through n minus one with it called its descent set. And these are the positions i where your permutation maps i to a larger number than it does i plus one. So these are kind of easy to pick out if you write your permutations in one line notation, where here I mean like the first, putting seven first means that one gets sent to seven, putting five second means that two gets sent to five and so on. And um, then you can just look where the, where the positions are, where a number is bigger than the number to its right. Here that happens in positions one, two, four, and six. So your descent set is one, two, four, six. And you can think about kind of uh, creating some like abstract linear combinations of them. So like thinking within the group algebra, um, you can think about like summing uh, all the permutations whose descent set are within a particular set J and call that XJ. So for example, if we're working with n is four and we want to find this element that's associated to the set one, three, we'd think about what are all the subsets of one, three? Well, we have empty set one, three, and one, three. And I've kind of color coded um, like the xj. So like these green ones are the elements whose descent set are, are equal to one. Where is this going to be set? So, so. Uh, so. Yeah, so actually, if you write this in Cox, uh, like kind of in terms of um, these are like the descents of the permutation, if you were to write it in like with Coxeter words instead, except you usually do it on the other side then. But like, I don't know, like S1, S2 would have left descent set uh, one because S1 shortens the, the length. <laughs> Do these S1, S2s? Okay, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, so these are like, you think about it in terms of length, Coxeter length is, is maybe the more traditional way to think about it and how you generalize it to other types. Yeah, other questions? Okay. Okay, and so it turns out, and this is like pretty surprising, I think that uh, this like 
C-span of these elements is closed under multiplication. So you get a subalgebra of the group algebra um, that's often called Solomon's descent algebra or, or just the descent algebra. And I'll be denoting it by this like sigma n today. Okay, so why did I bring up this like different algebra? Well, it turns out that it's actually related to these like invariant theory questions. Uh, and this is due to Bidiger, who proved this in his, his PhD thesis. Um, so to state his result, I need to kind of give this definition, which tells you, like, given a descent set, how to get a sequence of integers, which basically is just counting, like, the gaps. So, like, for this example, uh, you always write down the first number, so 1, and then there's, like, 4 minus 1 is 3, so I put a 3 here. 5 minus 4 is 1, so I put a 1 here. And since n is 7, and 7 minus 5 is 2. That's where this two comes from. But basically, like, you can map um, this xj to the sum of faces in the Brader instrument whose block sizes have these, like, integers. And uh, this is an algebra anti-isomorphism uh, between the descent algebra and the invariant subalgebra of the Brader instrument. And this was kind of my original motivation for thinking about these LRBs, like, under group actions. Because in this kind of uh, most famous, at least to me, case, you get this very kind of interesting algebra. So anti in what sense? And that the multiplication gets reversed. So, like, uh, in the, did I, oh, I didn't, oh, I didn't name B. So B of A, B is equal to B of B times B of A. Yeah, it's a, or I could have maybe said isomorphic to like the opposite of this algebra instead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so oh, here's like an example of this isomorphism. So like, for example, here is uh, the descent algebra basis element uh, that goes with the set two. Um, like the integer sequence that goes with that is two one. So I've mapped this to the sum of all rays who whose um, block sizes are two one, which are these like purple ones here. So they actually are, are pretty nice to work with. And once you kind of play around with the braid arrangement, it, it feels like not such a strange theorem, but it, it makes a lot of sense. And so I think this is interesting just because like these are both algebras related to Coxeter groups that people studied, and it relates them, but it also turned out to be pretty useful as well. Um, so uh, this was like the way that Saliola used uh, to compute the quiver of the descent algebra as he thought about it as like uh, living within this braid arrangement and used kind of like uh, the like LRB structure of the braid arrangement to, and like the group action to understand uh, this quiver. Okay, so yeah, let's maybe recap what we've seen. Uh, we've kind of first, we've answered the first question, or Bidiger answered the, the first question, which is what does this invariance of algebra look like? And, and we got a very nice answer, uh, and that namely it's the descent algebra. Oh yeah, here I guess I wrote opposite. <laughs> um, and this kind of opens the door to studying other isotopic subspaces as well. And in fact, Bidiger kind of like started this study in his thesis he looked at uh, the sign isotopic subspace and saw that's just a one-dimensional uh, vector space that also happens to be a subalgebra. It's a nilpotent subalgebra. Um, but you could kind of ask more in that every all of these subspaces are, are descent algebra modules. And um, besides like the descent algebra as an alge like module over itself, there's not actually that many descent algebra modules studied. So this seems kind of like one way to kind of start learning about like some of more representations of the descent algebra. So uh, we're gonna try to figure out what each of these isotopic subspaces look like as descent algebra modules. And to do that, we have to say a little bit about like the representation theory of the descent algebra. 
So um, this was first studied by Garcia and Reutenauer, at least in the type A case, and later on, um, many people kind of finished it off for all Coxker groups. Um, but it turns out that the, uh, the simple modules are indexed by integer partitions of n, and they're all one-dimensional. And so also the, any idempotent, family of idempotents in a complete family of primitive orthogonal idempotents will also be indexed by these partitions of n. Um, but unfortunately, even like when you're working over nice fields like the complex numbers, this is not a semi-simple algebra. So sometimes the representations can be tricky to understand. Um, so rather like we're not gonna always be able to decompose representations into a direct sum of simples. Uh, so instead, um, I'm gonna focus on finding the composition multiplicities of, of simples in these modules. So like I'll use this notation to mean if I'm studying a descent algebra representation of V, how many times does the simple M lambda appear as a composition factor? In, in any composition series. Okay, uh, and I'll also say a little bit about the representation theory of the symmetric group, um, partially because I tend to think about it through a more combinatorial perspective. So I wanna kind of give the translation for, for what I'll be saying later on. Um, but these uh, irreducibles are also indexed by partitions of N. And I tend to think about these like characters as being part of like a large ring, uh, a graded ring, where M, the nth graded piece is the Z module generated by uh, the irreducible characters of SN. Uh, so like the way multiplication works is this induction product. So if you have a character of SN and a character of SM, um, I want to think about like an, an outer tensor product of them, where this is like the first M letters are being commuted within each other, the last M letters are being commuted within each other, and then we induce up to the to the group S N plus M. And like if you think about this ring structure, turns out it's like exactly the same thing as uh, the ring of symmetric functions. So it won't actually matter to us today like what these symmetric functions are at all, uh, but when I write in H, we should think about um, this as coming from like HN comes from the trivial character on SN. And if I write like H lambda or HW, where these are like sequences of integers, I just mean multiply the H's uh, for, like within the sequence. And the S's, these are called sure functions. Um, but when I see these, I should just think that these like correspond to the irreducibles who are indexed by lambda. Uh, and another thing that will kind of come up today is this notion of plethysm. So plethysm comes up when you're dealing with wreath products, and then you take the Frobenius characteristic. So if I'm taking the wreath product of two symmetric groups and then induce up, that's going to correspond to plethysm in the symmetric function side. And plethysm is something that like people are really trying hard to understand in algebraic combinatorics, but it's uh, still very mysterious. So um, when we get a plethysm, we kind of think about that as like as far as we can simplify. Okay. Okay. So now let's go back to our question, which is what did these isotopic subspaces look like as modules over the descent algebra? Um, so this is like a first approximation. It's not uh, a great answer, but we can decompose it a little bit further. Uh, not necessarily into uh, in decomposables. In fact, these pieces are sometimes going to not be in decomposable. Uh, but it turns out we can kind of decompose it a little further by multiplying by descent algebra idempotents. Um, and Oh yeah, emu is an idempotent in the descent algebra, or okay, now I'm thinking about it in the face algebra, so kind of under this, this anti-isomorphism. But yeah, this is forms part of a 
uh, family of a complete system of primitive orthogonal eigenpotents for the phase algebra. Yeah. And um, what these numbers are is not going to be important, like also for the top, but it turns out that the dimensions are quite easy to compute in terms of combinatorial objects as well, like composition, standard down tableau, and, and these Koska numbers. So kind of to give us like a, a visual um, thing of like what this is saying is now back to our rectangle ring. Every row is an isotopic subspace, and now we've divided like the rows into some columns. And so each box here is a representation of like both a symmetric group and the descent algebra. And all that uh, proposition before was saying is these boxes are representations and we know their dimension, but it doesn't say anything about the representation structure at all. Uh, so like a better answer would be to kind of understand what the composition factors are in each box. So like to think about uh, like this box would be saying like that the simple M22 appears with composition multiplicity three, M31 with composition multiplicity three and so on. So just kind of, a, it would be nice if we could figure out how to place these, um, these boxes. All right, so uh, some of these boxes are actually taken care of um, by like previous work of others. So the bottom row is, is the trivial isotopic subspace. So it's the opposite of the descent algebra. So it actually turns out like the boxes in the bottom row are just the projective and decomposables of the descent algebra. And Garcia and Reutenauer computed the Karkan invariants, which give you these composition factors or composition multiplicities in their original paper and got a, a nice formula for it. I will say a little more about it, what it means on the next slide, but it involves some, some Linden, Linden words. So their rule has to do with these Linden words and uh, Linden words are, imagine you have some word on the alphabet, like one, two, and so on. A word is a Linden word if it's strictly lexicographically smaller than all of its cyclic reordering's. So the word 2929 is not a Linden word because if I cycle it twice, I get the same word back. And that's not strictly smaller. Uh, but 29299 is smallest, or is a Linden word because any time, amount of times you cycle it, um, you'll get a new word and a word that's like, lexicographically larger than 29299. So a kind of a non-obvious, at least not to me, fact is that every word has a unique factorization into weekly decreasing Linden words. And this is like what Garcia and Reutenauer used to find these Carton invariants. So what they did, if we go back to their formula is they said, look at like the number of compositions that rearrange to mu. So this means integer sequences who are reorderings of some partition. So for example, like if we wanted to fill in this box going to 2, 1, 1, I'd look at the three orderings of 2, 1, 1, and I'd do their Linden factorization. So for instance, 1, 2, 1, it's Linden factorization is the word 1, 2, followed by the word 1. And the Linden type is something you get by just summing the letters within each factor. So, you know, here every letter has its own factor. So it's Linden type is 2, 1, 1. Here you'd sum one and two and you get a three and a one. And when they're all together, you get Linden type four. So that's basically where these, um, that's where these composition factors are coming from, uh, which I think is kind of an interesting I like a surprising answer. Okay. Um, and the other case that was already done is uh, by work of Uyabur Reyes, also in his PhD thesis. And he did up to like what we can currently know like is, is a complete answer for these boxes. So he did 
the boxes in the, the rightmost column, so the column that corresponds to the partition one to the n. And he said the number of times like the simple m lambda shows up is the number of standard young Pueblo of shape mu times the compass times uh, the multiplicity of s nu in this symmetric function, uh, which I'll say a bit about in the next slide. But people don't know these values. This is another thing that people have been working on a long time. So uh, this is this was like accepted as kind of the a good answer for, for this last column. And I should say he wasn't really doing it in the context of trying to find composition factors. This actually, he was working on the shuffling, shuffling in the, the face algebra and trying to find like the eigenspace stru structures of certain shuffling operators. But his work uh, is equivalent to, to finding these boxes. Okay. So these um, L lambdas I had on the last slide are the Frobenius characteristic of these uh, special characters called higher Lie characters. And there's like a lot of different ways to define it. Um, but the one that I think is maybe the simplest to say and also the most relevant to our story is that you can define Ln, so if your partition is just N, as the uh, Frobenius characteristic of the top homology of the partition lattice tensored with the sign representation. And then if you want to get L nu for any partition nu, uh, where the partition has M1 ones, M2 twos, and so on, you can take this plethysm product. So remember, H's are like trivials on the outside. Uh, these L's are defined here, although I didn't make that one curly and um, plethysm kind of goes with brief product. And yeah, this is called Thrall's problem. Uh, how are these expanded into shear functions? Um, this is kind of something people are trying to work out. Okay, so kind of the goal is to show you this like full answer, which is what something I had been working on, which is, you know, if you have a random box, how do you find the composition factors that appear there. And we don't need to go through like really the details of all the answer, but as you might expect, like the answer involved both Linden words and uh, these higher Lie characters. And so um, it's kind of actually simpler to state in terms of a generating function here. So I've stated it in terms of like a coefficient of a certain generating function that involves both of these uh, objects. And I think uh, the method was kind of interesting um, for this, and that's what made me become interested in these LRVs. So I wanted to say a little bit about how um, how I got this formula. So okay, so we started out with this question, which is like uh, find the composition factors of these descent algebra representations, and so I'll, I'll go through each of these steps. Like each has its own slide. Um, but we can convert this problem to understanding some symmetric group representation, which I can be changed to thinking about post-set topology. And then there's like a, some kind of tools available to, to work on changing this into symmetric functions. So uh, the first one is, okay, you start with this uh, uh, descent algebra representations. You can change it into understanding a symmetric group representation kind of with some very standard tools in representation theory of finite dimensional algebras. And so once um, this was apparent to me, I, it, it probably felt more doable because I was more comfortable with the representation theory of the symmetric group than the descent algebra. And then um, you can actually change it into a question about post-set topology. And at first, when I was showing everybody this, they thought I made the problem a lot worse. Like this <laughs> looks a lot worse. But this actually, for me, was a lot easier to work with because these idempotents are a little tricky to work with. And there's actually a lot known about um, the topology of the partition lattice. So this kind of uses some work of, of Saliola, who looked at related spaces uh, where if you multiply by base algebra idempotents instead. He connected them to the cohomology of 
intervals in the subpartition lattice. And then it's just some properties of induced representations and idempotence. And then there's this kind of like pesky, like sign twist you have to do to make things behave well with the group action. Okay, and then this last step was maybe the, the trickiest one for me, but it involved, there was a lot of tools to work with and like a big part of it was uh, Sundrum has like a, a very nice paper with a lot of representations that come from uh, the homology of partition lattices and as well as like Stanley and Kriashko and, and Matthew's theorem and then just some plethas and properties and things like that. And that's how we kind of got to this generating function at the end. Um, so I think, I mean, we have time. Do I have time to say a little bit more? Yeah. Okay. Okay, then I can say a little bit more about um, what I've been thinking about now, because um, kind of in the process of when I heard the problem and learned about this post set topology approach, I kind of became interested in uh, can you say this type of thing for other left regular bands? So um, I guess even before that, I should say that everything I said uh, kind of works for all the reflection arrangements, except for the last step of symmetric functions. Uh, so you can still like use twisted post-set topology to figure out these representations. Um, Salman's descent algebra is defined for all types. The base monoid is defined for all types. I kind of cheated Bidiger out of his theorem. This, his theorem was for all types as well. Um, but kind of one issue I have is that, you know, in other types, the symmetric function theory is not so well worked out and the partition, the lattices are not so well studied. So I've kind of stopped here instead of trying to like really understand these representations. Um, and then I became kind of interested in these, this other class of LRBs that was defined by Margot, Salil, and Steinberg. And uh, they found like that there's a large class of LRBs. And when I say large, I mean a lot of the LRBs that kind of like naturally appeared in the wild turned out to belong to this group. Um, so these are LRBs who have, um, who they're, oh, I guess what I said, this is not exactly the right definition. There, there are other posts that, um, has certain sub posets that are face posets of regular CW complexes. But what kind of captured my interest is that uh, a lot of the hyperplane semi-group theory generalized seems to generalize nicely to these uh, CW LRBs. Uh, so like some, another like interesting example um, that we mentioned earlier of CW LRBs was discovered by Margola Saliola and Steinberg, um, where these spaces of cat zero cube complexes. So here's like a cat zero cube complex, a very small one. And then one of the examples of cat zero cube complexes I've become interested in are these uh, spaces of phylogenetic trees. So they can also have a semi-group structure associated to them. And so I've been trying to think like, about when uh, kind of these techniques for the descent algebra work, work for these CW LRBs as well. And so uh, under some kind of specific conditions that make uh, like the CW LRB good and make this uh, debt character well-defined, um, Ben was helping me to get rid of <laughs> some of these conditions today, hopefully. Um, you can kind of do a similar process um, where you can convert the invariance of algebra representation to a group representation and to a twisted post-set topology question. Um, you might wonder, like, does this work for all LRBs? And sadly, does not work for all LRBs. Um, like the free LRB is a counter example, um, the post-set topology, the support lattice, this Boolean lattice uh, is does not actually give you the information you want there. Um, but yeah, I'd like to know more about what can be said in general or, or for special classes of, of LRBs. And I think, uh, yeah, that's all that I had.
Any questions or comments? Maybe I have a, 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 a brief comment. In some sense, teeth sort of, but not stated in an elegant way, I also had the dissociative for proof. He just didn't have the right language. Teeth wrote the appendix for Solomon's paper, and he used the base monoid to prove the results of Solomon on the descent algebra, but he didn't know it was a monoid. Instead, he just had these projections, which the Odysseus is building onto faces, and he proved some property of composing these projections, which is exactly as the associated law. And if you just reinterpret everything in terms of semi utility then his proof is the same. But, and which I'm going to hear from unless I or Graham, one of them says it. So he was kind of also along the right track, but because he didn't accept that this was a semi he kind of missed that there's a nice way to say this and you can use the whole theory of algebra to actually under, understand it. And I think about Solomon's motivation for this is that the semi simple push to the descent algebra is a character in the symmetric group. And so the descent algebra is like a non commutative character ring, and many of the more weird formulas of symmetric and character theory of the symmetric group can be understood more easily in the non commutative case. Where you have less terms and you expand things out, and that was sort of the motivation for why Solomon and other these people studied that algebra, it's sort of a non commutative character in the symmetric group. Any other questions? Yeah, Graham, you have a question. I don't think there's anything in the chat.